where we live, there are tons of different kinds of birds, plants, and rocks. So many that it's hard to keep track of them all. So Squeaks and I use a special tool to help us record all of our discoveries, a field journal. A field journal is a special kind of notebook that scientists use when they're working outside. They use it to record important facts about the things they see out in the world, and their own thoughts and questions about what they're seeing. And you can use a field journal to do the same thing. If it's spring where you live, like it is here, maybe you've started to see lots of flowers. You can use your field journal to get to know the flowers in your neighborhood. Your field journal can be anything you can write in, a notebook, a binder, or even just a few pieces of paper stapled together. When you're ready to study the flowers, just grab your field journal, some pencils and crayons, and a grown-up. Then head outside to find as many flowers as you can. When you first get outside, be sure to write down the date or have a grown-up do it for you and then make some notes about the weather. Is it hot or cold outside? Has it rained recently? Then find a flower and examine it carefully. Ask yourself questions like, where's the flower growing? What kind of soil is it in? Is there a lot of sunlight in that spot? And are there bugs hanging out around the flower? Write down everything you see and think about when you're looking at the flower in your field journal. Next comes the fun part, draw what you see. Scientists make very careful field drawings to help them keep track of every detail of what they're studying. You can draw the different petals and leaves on the flower and show how big it is. The more carefully you look and draw, the better you'll get to know each flower. And when you're done drawing, you can choose another flower to study next. Once you've studied a few flowers, you can be done for the day. And now that you've started your field journal, you can come back to look at the flowers again tomorrow, or even in a few days. Then do the same thing. Write down what you see, like whether the flower is getting lots of sunlight or if there are bugs flying around, and draw another picture of it. Over time, you'll be able to see how the flower is changing, like if it grows more after it rains a lot. That's why scientists keep field journals so they can remember the things that they learned and look through their notes to see how things change over time. And you can use your field journal to study more than just flowers. For example, if there are lots of birds around, you can use your field journal to keep track of them too. When you're studying birds and other animals, you can pay attention to things like what time of day you see them, if they're alone or in groups, what they sound like, and what they're eating. Oh, you're right, Squeaks. We haven't even talked about the best part of having a field journal. You can decorate it. You can cover it in cool stickers and drawings like we have. Hi, everyone. Squeaks and I are enjoying a beautiful day outside the fort. Oh, look, there's a bee. Oh, it landed on that flower. Let's watch and see what it does. We'll get a little closer, but not bother it. There it goes, buzzing off to find another flower. You know, bees are some of my favorite animals to watch. They always seem so busy. But do you ever wonder what they do all day? You might already know that bees are insects, like ants and beetles. Like all insects, bees have six legs, and three body parts. In bees, these body parts are often brown or yellow, and sometimes they're striped with both colors. Bees also have four wings. When their wings move back and forth fast enough to make them fly, they make a buzzing sound that we think of when we hear the word bee. And there's another part of the bee that you've probably heard about the stinger. But not all bees have stingers. And the ones that do don't sting unless they have a really good reason to. Like when they're frightened, or to protect themselves, or to chase other animals away from their nest. There are lots of different kinds of bees, but the two kinds that you've probably seen most often are bumblebees and honeybees. Bumblebees are easy to spot because they're big and fluffy. Honeybees are a little smaller and don't look like they're covered in fuzz the way bumblebees do. Both kinds of bees make honey, but bumblebees only make a little, while honeybees produce a lot of that sweet, sticky stuff. And both kinds of bees also live in big groups, inside nests that we call hives. Do you want to see inside a honeybee hive? Let's have a look. This bee is the queen. No, she doesn't wear a crown, but she does have a really important job. She stays in the hive all day and lays eggs. Lots of them. After three or four days, these eggs will hatch and eventually grow into adult honeybees. Most of the other bees that live in the hive are workers. And worker bees? Yup, Squeaks, they do almost all the work. There are lots of jobs for them to do, like helping to build the hive and keeping the hive clean. But their main job, the one that they do almost all of the time, 
is to look for food. That's what the bee that we saw was doing. She was getting food from that flower. When a worker bee lands on a flower, she drinks a sweet juice from the inside of the flower. This juice is called nectar. While she's on the flower, the bee also brushes up against the yellow dust that the flower makes. This dust is called pollen. So while she's gathering nectar, the bee also gets covered with pollen as she moves around on the flower. When the bee has as much nectar and pollen as she can carry, she flies back to the hive. She feeds some of the nectar and pollen to the baby bees and to the queen, and then she turns most of the nectar into honey. Bees fly back and forth all day collecting nectar and pollen from flowers and taking it back to the hive. When it gets dark, they go back to the hive and rest, and then they're up early the next morning to start again. If you've ever heard the expression, busy as a bee, now you know why we say that. So if you see a bee, you don't have to be afraid of it, but do leave her alone and give her lots of room to get her work done. Squeaks and I were just outside bird watching and there are so many different kinds of birds. Some, like the Northern Cardinal, can sing beautiful songs. Just listen. We call birds that sing like this Songbirds. Lots of birds sing for different reasons, and for songbirds like cardinals, singing is an important way for them to talk to each other. Cardinals will chirp and chitter all year long, but in the spring, they bring out their loudest and prettiest songs. Why do they sing so much in the spring? They're getting ready to raise their babies. Like most animals you know, cardinals are usually either a boy called a male or a girl called a female, and they're pretty easy to tell apart. Male cardinals are bright red, and female cardinals are brown. And both male and female cardinals sing, often for different reasons. But during the spring, they both sing much more than they usually do. You see, in the springtime, cardinals are getting ready to build a nest, lay eggs, and raise little baby birds. But they can't do it alone. They need to find a mate, another cardinal, to help them feed and protect their babies. A male cardinal wants to become a dad, so when spring comes around, he usually starts looking for a female mate to have and raise babies with. He'll start singing and hope that a female cardinal will hear his song. But showing a female cardinal that he'll be a good dad takes a lot of work. Female cardinals want to find a mate who's strong and smart, who can find lots of food, and who can protect their babies from other animals that might want to eat them. So the male cardinal has to show that he's tough enough to protect his new family. And the best way to do this is to sing loudly. By singing loudly, a male cardinal says, here I am and I'm not afraid of anything. He knows that other cardinals can hear him, but there are also other types of animals listening too. Ones like hawks or cats that might want to eat him. So his loud song shows that he isn't even afraid of getting eaten. Male cardinals will even try to sing louder than other males who might be nearby to prove that they're the toughest bird around tough enough to be a great dad. Now, to call out to female birds, male cardinals sing a special song called a mating call. This song is different from his normal song. It's meant just for the female. A female that's nearby will want to see which brave male is singing his mating call, so she can decide if she wants to raise her babies with him. If she likes his song, she'll let him fly over and they'll pair up for the spring. Now, it's not just the males that sing. Female cardinals will also sing more in the spring, too. Females learn different songs than the males, and scientists are still trying to learn what the females are saying. Maybe someday we'll be able to understand everything these amazing birds are saying to each other. Until then, we're just lucky that we get to enjoy their special springtime songs. Boy Squeaks, it's been a great day hiking in the woods, but I think I'm ready to go home now. What are you looking at over there? You're counting? Well, there's stuff that we can count back at the fort. Oh, you're counting the rings of that tree stump. And you're already at 64? Well, you should keep going then. You know, trees seem like a pretty ordinary, everyday thing. We usually don't think about them much. But they're really helpful. They help clean our air, they give us wood and paper to make tables and chairs and books, and did you know they're great storytellers? You just have to know how to listen. You're right, Squeaks, trees can't talk, but they can still tell us a lot without using words. When we study a tree, we can learn all sorts of clues from it, and by putting together all the clues, we can tell the story of its life. See, during a tree's growing season, that's spring and summer, the tree will get taller and wider and add another layer of wood around its middle. 
Those layers are the rings. Some trees live in warmer places where they can grow all year long, so they don't have rings, but this one sure does. They're kind of like a secret code. We just have to know how to read them. Early in the growing season, the tree grows a lighter colored wood called early wood. And then in the late summer, it grows a darker wood called late wood. And I bet you can guess where those names came from. One light ring plus one dark ring make up one year in the tree's life, which means you can count how many years the tree was growing and you can see what those years were like. Let's take a look at the rings on this tree stump. How many rings did you count, Squeaks? 78? If the tree was 78 years old when it was cut down, it must have some pretty exciting stories to tell. And it recorded all those years for us in its rings, like a little book about its life. The rings in the middle here are the earliest ones. It looks like the first few years of this tree's life were really great. It has nice, wide, evenly spaced rings, which means the tree had some healthy growing seasons. And then I see some thin rings over here. That means the tree was having a tough time. It didn't get everything it needed, so it didn't grow as much. Maybe it didn't have enough sunlight, or maybe there was a drought, which means that this area didn't get enough rain. Or insects might have eaten a lot of the tree's leaves that year, which made it grow more slowly. And then the rings get wider on one side. So just when the tree was starting to grow up, something started pushing on it, and it leaned to one side. So it grew thicker on that side to help support itself. And then there are a few thin rings right after that. And then our tree evened out and grew some nice, thick, even rings. Maybe some other trees had been pushing it aside and crowding the sunlight. And then maybe they fell down, so our tree finally had all the sunlight it needed. Oh wow, it looks like there might have been a small fire after that. A whole side of the tree was scarred, but it kept growing new wood over the scar every year. This tree had some good years and some really tough ones, but it stuck it out and it kept growing. It lived a long, full life until it was chopped down. Oh, don't worry, Squeaks. We don't have to chop down a tree to count its rings and learn all about it. Scientists have a special tool for that. It's called an increment borer, which looks kind of like the letter T. By putting the long, thin bit into the tree and turning the handles around and around, a scientist can get the increment borer all the way into the center of the tree and pull out a thin strip of wood called a core. That doesn't hurt the tree too much because these cores are tiny. They're less wide than my fingernail, but they can tell us the story of that tree's life just like a tree stump would. We just looked at the life of one tree. Now imagine if you had lots and lots of cores of trees from the same area and looked at all of them together. If the same two trees survived a fire or a very cold year, we can find out by comparing their rings. And with enough cores, we can even figure out exactly what year those things happened. There are scientists whose whole job is to study trees rings like these. One thing they do is match up different samples to each other to figure out what happened in these trees' lives. We can even compare histories from the trees with records people have kept of the weather. Those records usually go back 100 or 150 years, but some trees are much older than that, by hundreds or even thousands of years. The more samples scientists have, the more they can learn, both about how an area's weather has changed over time and about big events like droughts or insect infestations. That's a much bigger story than the life of just one tree. Trees go through a lot of rough times that make it hard for them to keep going, but they keep growing and growing growing all through the droughts and the insects and the fires. I think I'm going to try and be more like a tree. Squeaks and I are spending the day inside because it's raining. It rained yesterday too, and I remember that because I wrote it down in my weather journal. My weather journal is where I write down what the weather is like every day. Do you keep a weather journal? Well, you can. It's easy. Each day, just look out your window or step outside and see what the weather is like. Then you can write it down or draw a picture like Squeaks does of what you see. There are a few different kinds of weather to look for. It can be rainy, like it is today, or sunny, when the sun is high in the sky and shining bright. Or when there's no sun but lots of clouds, that's cloudy. 
There's also snowy, when snowflakes fall from the sky. And windy, when you might need to hold onto your hat. Weather can be unpredictable. It's hard to guess what's gonna happen next. It can be cloudy one day and sunny the next, but over long periods of time, weather often follows certain patterns. For example, it might be mostly sunny in the summer, but it might snow a lot in the winter. So depending on what season it is where you live, the weather might have a certain pattern. If you're in the middle of a season, like summer, you might notice it's sunny and warm for five days in a row. That's a pattern. But if the season is changing, the weather might not follow a pattern that's easy to guess. Say if winter is ending, you might find that a few days are colder and windier, but then the next few days are sunny and warm. That's because the season is changing, going from a chillier winter to a warmer spring. That's why I like to keep a weather journal to see what weather patterns I can observe for myself. Scientists who study the weather every day as their job are called meteorologists. But you don't have to be a meteorologist to watch the weather where you live. In fact, all you need is a notebook, a pencil or crayon, and a thermometer. Besides going outside to see and feel what the weather is like, you can also look at a thermometer to find out more about the weather. This is a thermometer. It tells you what the temperature is outside, how hot or how cold it is. The higher the liquid is inside of the thermometer, the hotter it is outside and the lower the liquid is, the colder it is outside. If you want to keep a weather journal like I do, then you might want to see if your family can get an outdoor thermometer to help you record the temperature. Then every day, you can look outside and write down what you see, or draw a picture. Next, look at the temperature on your thermometer and write down how hot or cold it is. Just look for the line on the thermometer that's closest to the top of the liquid. That's your temperature. I like to write in my weather journal at the same time every day right after breakfast. You can pick a time that works best for you and observe the weather at the same time every day for five days. After five days, look back through your weather journal. What was the weather like this week? Did you see any patterns? Can you guess what the weather might be like on the sixth day based on what you've seen already? Share your journal with your friends and if you want, you can keep observing the weather for more than five days. If you watch the weather for say a whole month, you'll be able to watch the weather change. In fact, you'll probably see at least a few of the different types of weather that we talked about earlier. A mix of sunny, cloudy, and rainy days. And if you keep your weather journal for a whole year, you'll be able to see the weather where you live at its hottest and its coldest. And you'll have a list either in your words or your pictures of everything that happened that year. Then you'll know when the first snow of the winter was and the highest and lowest temperatures of the year. And if it rained more some times of the year than others. So grab your notebook and get outside. It's time to watch the weather.